we okay so i just wanted to give you guys a heads up i'm going to start recording but gail is not going to be here um because of her camping trip actually she's she may be on the road headed home but um they were up at lake shasta which is kind of cool and hopefully it was beautiful up there it's been if, if you see my photo go blank, it's because my husband's making my breakfast and we'll bring it in and I'll go blank why I, so you don't have to watch me eat. Okay, no worries. <laughs> All right, let's see. I am uh, looks like it's going to just be a small gathering so that means we get to talk more and um, I'm going to share my screen and I have a very short just a few slides today. So um, um, you know the drill about the housekeeping. <laughs> so let's talk real quickly. And I was just doing it real quickly about our call last time. Um, what do you remember from some of the takeaways when we had our two guests, Katie and, and Jennifer on who were talking about bridging the gap and we were, we shared a couple different examples. Anything that you uh, remember to take away from what we talked about last time? I, I do. This is Judy. Boy, I thought that was really a, a, a great session. And I like the one about, um, uh, I think it was Scott says his ideas are always, you know, put down and how they suggest don't go in with one, go in with three. I mean, I mean, that made so much sense. Um, yeah, it's so, it that was, way they have one to choose from. And doing nothing is is um, is an option, right? That's one of the options. Uh -huh. Yeah. Um, I think that's an important one to remember that we sometimes forget that, but you can then say, what are the pros and cons to that option? Right. If, if, not, if you don't say it, even at least people start going, well, yeah, if we don't do anything, what is the outcome for that? So that's yeah. a good one. Um, I thought that was the best one I got out of that because so often um, that's the case more than that. <laughs> Usually that's the case with everybody and they explained why. So I thought that was good too, why people react that way. And by the way, that recording is out on the, our District 5190 YouTube channel. So if we wanted to okay. go back and re-listen to it, um, it's great. It's available there. Um, anything else? Any other takeaways from last time? Any takeaway from last week? Yeah. No, I thought I thought it was really important. Um, the aspect of when you come into a confrontation. That you that you take that person aside and you talk to them about that. I think that's really important because we don't want it broadcast all over the place. Um, we don't want to threaten them. They're already threatened uh, or feeling threatened. Um, I think that was a very important aspect. Yeah, it's um, we don't want to shut people down. I mean, and, and I think especially in Rotary when. It, we're all here as volunteers. We're all here because we want to be, right? So, I mean, if you think about it, the last thing you want to do is make somebody feel badly. And yet, if they're inadvertently, hopefully inadvertently, if they're making other people feel badly or something really is going on, it does need to be addressed. It does need to be talked about because um, one negative conversation like that or a negative situation like that can literally shut down a whole club mm -hmm. um, and people then start not showing up to the meetings because they feel uncomfortable and even if it's not targeted yourself if you see something going on between other people and it's uncomfortable you go I don't want to I don't want to be part of that so you start seeing people not showing up it's like is there something else that needs to be addressed here so i remember um i think i i mentioned this last time but we actually had a circumstance where we we brought a member aside and we actually put him on probation for three months and said you're not living up to the three-way the three-way the four-way test and, and and this is why 
And you need to think about it because it's not just within the Rotary Club, it's outside and in the community, he was making some comments that were not Rotary-like. So um, interesting how that can happen. And um, I, think, I think sometimes we have to put ourselves out there. Um, people become frustrated in their own personal lives. An example of that was when I was just a governor, I uh, had a, a incoming president say to me, I'm not going to go to pets. I've been to pets, I'm not going to go to pets. I don't have time to go to pets. So I said, okay, Kevin, but the deal is you need to go to the business assembly. And he said, okay. So time comes along and business assembly and he's not going to business assembly because he's overwhelmed at work. And I appreciated that because he had just opened a huge um, hardware store. And I said, Kevin, you really need to take that time. It's probably four or five hours. It's not that big a drive for you. And you really need to go. Things have changed from Rotary. I'm not going, you have no idea what it's like when you have employees and you have vendors and you have customers, you have no idea what that's like. And I said to him, well, let's look at it this way, Kevin. I've had 181 patients. I've had a staff of over 200. I've had families that have gone along with that. And I've had their doctors. So yes, I understand what you're talking about. And he was quiet. And he went to assembly. And he said, thank you so much. Things have changed. I'm sorry I was the way I was. I didn't think you understood. So I think we have to be real personal on some of these things and give examples of how, yes, we can turn this around and make it a positive to both of us. Yeah, because it doesn't have to be you know, aggressive in when you address it. And I think that was a way you found agreement with him, actually. You, you, you could relate to what he was saying. He just didn't think you could. So you were able to give a way that you were, you were actually on the same page you understood. And even by him not attending in that way, if you really think about it, he was letting down your customers, his custo customers, if you want to think of his um he eased his customers, right? If he wasn't attending. So um, it's an interesting, it's an interesting example. It's good. Anything else about last week that we think we can apply or we can, we want to remember for going forward? Then we're just going to move right into today's topic. And today, I think as we move, uh, as we wrap up May and come into June, it really feels like that, you know, that, that uh, home stretch. And I know, well, Pamela's a PE, so she's going to be president in starting in July. And that last month or so, it's like, ah, am I ready? <laughs> Excuse me, Berta, I'm going to be uh, the, I'm the PE for 2022. Oh, 2022. Well, that's then you have a whole year to get ready. So good. <laughs> so, um, so longer to panic. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's one way to look at it. <laughs> Thanks, Judy. <laughs> uh, no, it's good. So, but I think that we do, uh, you know, oftentimes it's like, well, you know, I've said yes. But now what? I think it's, you know, an opportunity to just think about what does it take to prepare for leadership? And um, uh, I, I was hoping we'd have some more on. I think that part of it was, um, well, we're just, it's a busy time of the year. I found this little quote online and I thought it was kind of cute when, because sometimes we say yes to something and then in our head, we start doing the, oh, I'm not gonna do that. <laughs> I can't do it. I wanna do it, but uh, how do I do it? So I think this was a good little quote of some of the things that we go through in our head as we, as we move into something new. And I think leadership oftentimes is something new that we work, work towards. What do you think, 
Have you guys ever been in any of these steps? I think we all have. All. <laughs> all of them. Yeah. What I love is when you do get to the top, you really do is like, ah, I did do it. I was able to do it. I think this year was a good example. You know, if I look back at the, the clubs and the club presidents from this year, man, um, it was a tough year. And I have a feeling that probably a number of them were like, oh, I'm not going to do this. But everybody did. And everybody um, made it through. And um, I, I'm just so proud of all the clubs for actually really stepping up to this difficult year and accomplishing what they have. And um, I was last night at a uh, Area 5 um, foundation event dinner in person. And last Friday I was at another one for Area 7 in person. And there is so much pent up energy. It was so wonderful. It was great to hear you guys are going to have an in-person demotion because I think you'll start, you'll see how amazing. And Judy, you were just saying it about the kids too. Everybody's mm -hmm. so ready. So I have a feeling this next year, we're going to do amazing things because there's so much pent up energy and excitement about getting back together. I agree. Yeah. Um, but what do you think you can do to prepare for leadership? If you've said yes, and it doesn't have to be club president, it could be any position within the club that you haven't done before, or it's not with Rotary, maybe it's within your church or within another nonprofit that you're a part of. What, how do you prepare for a new role in leadership? What do you have to do? I think one of the uh, most important things is to make very good friends with your predecessor and find a way of learning from mistakes. That's a, a, a really good um, um, a really good point, Bruce. And I, I have to say I didn't add that to my list of things, but it's true. Um, at why do we want to make friends? quote unquote, with our predecessors in whatever role it is. Well, who knows better what the job Why? is what he's doing. It. Yeah, so we can learn from their ideas. What else can we learn from? Their mistakes. Yeah, they can <laughs> tell us. Well, it's true. Then they can tell it. Usually most people are pretty open. It's like, well, I really wish I had done X, or I really wish I hadn't done X, right? Um, there, I think most people who in any position will say, nah, yeah, this worked and this didn't, or I accomplished this and I really had hoped to do that. Um, um, so learning from others is a great one. What else can we do to prepare? I think one of the things that Gail would say is to go back and look at your vision. Um, that's been a really, I found that um, as chair of that committee, that was important for people to go back and review what the club wanted to do and to um, reevaluate that plan and see how many things that they did get done. Uh, it can always be done in one year. Maybe there can be some contingencies with it. Um, but it gives you a feeling of what it is. If it's been longer than five years, you probably should do another one because things change drastically, as we know. But I think that at least gives you some idea of where the club was coming from when that vision plan was there. Yeah, I'm totally in agreement. We're actually going to try our first one, uh, our first virtual one, doing it via Zoom. Um, I think we're going to try to do it next month. So that'll be interesting to do. Uh, we're going to uh, work with one of the clubs. But speaking about that, the visioning, and I'd say if it's more than three years old, you probably should revisit because things are moving so fast, it seems like these days. 
um, that you may want to do another one. Um, but having that vision where, and the love, I love the part about visioning because it, it's everybody's input. It's not just you coming in as the leader. And that's the nice part about Rotary is you don't have, to, you don't have to create a vision on your own. In fact, you shouldn't, right? It shouldn't just be what you want. It should be what the club wants. It should be what everyone else around you, um, what, and combine it as a group. Um, as a group's vision. And yet, I will also say, is there a place for a personal vision when you're a leader? Absolutely. So what's the difference between the club's vision, because we should have one for the club of what the club wants, and, and what your personal vision is? Because I think sometimes there's a... a we don't talk about this part, about those distinctions. What's the personal vision versus the club vision? I don't know if you do um, board retreats here, but I think it's important for the incoming president to take his board for one day, starting in the morning, having lunch, and go through the vision and see if there's a, if there's a comment um, focus that the board would like to achieve. Um, that makes it a stronger program when you bring it to the club in total. So I think that um, that's one way to prepare for your years to have a, to have a retreat. We do talk about, and we suggest that all the clubs do that, uh, with club presidents, I should say, you know, with their boards. We suggest that they have a retreat of some sort, whether it's a full day or half a day or at least you know something to get away and actually just focus on that for um, that time period for that very reason to really make sure that the the board is in sync with what they want to accomplish that coming year and like you said it's an easier way to sell it if you will to the club uh, to get buy-in if there's a whole uh, the the board is all on board with doing that so, you know, if we come back to that idea of a personal vision, I, I am a believer that as the leader, you still want to have, you know, okay, this is, this is the vision for what we want to accomplish as the club. But what about you? You know, what do you want to bring towards that club? What's the vision for yourself that you want to achieve? Is there a piece of that that you think is important that you should be thinking about? What might you want to bring as a leader, you know, whether it's the president of the club or, you know, the foundation chair and you've never done it before? What, what might, as an individual, what might you want to bring to that role? Well, you might want to ask people enthusiasm for the role. Um, right. You, you sell a lot of stuff by how, how much you have invested in it. But uh, I think the answer to your original question is very interesting between personal uh, vision and club, club vision. I think there has to be willing to see where his personal, his, uh, personal vision fits in to the club vision rather than taking over and making the club vision his vision. Yeah, and I, I think of it like, okay, I love your suggestion of enthusiasm. So if, if that was on my vision, I'm gonna come, I'm gonna be a leader with enthusiasm. It might be one thing that before each club meeting, you kind of just check in with yourself. Where am I? What do I, what, what am I gonna do today to be enthusiastic, right? Or maybe it, you want to bring, um, uh, more learn. Let's just say your foundation chair, and you want to bring. It off. You must have touched it. You're still not going. Hi, Pamela. We can hear you. And hubby. Sorry about that. I'm trying to get her going. Okay, you went mute there. So, thank you. 
Okay. I'm just trying to get her. She lost the audio. I was trying to help her. So sorry to interfere there. Oh, that's okay. I just wanted to make sure you knew that we were, <laughs> you were part of that conversation there. That's okay. Anyway, I think there is a place that we identify what we want to bring forward towards a, a role and keep that in the back of our mind as the leader. We always want to keep the vision of what we're trying to do with the club. But I think there's a piece of the vision, a personal vision that's about being. That's my, my thought. Um, you know, like I want to make sure that we educate the club about the foundation, let's say. That might be something my personal thing is. Um, or bring enthusiasm. Or um, I want to always be open to everybody's ideas. That's my own thing. I, I want to make sure that everyone, that I am allowing that to happen. So as the leader, you think about what you want to, to um how you want to be as you um, come into that role. Um, so aside from vision, which is great, and what the club, and if, if like Helene was saying, if you haven't done it for three years, maybe schedule a new one for the club or at least revisit where you are. Um, what else can we do to prepare? Take advantage of whatever resources you can find. I think one of the things that are newer, I can say newer based upon the years I've been around, are newer Rotarians and step in the leadership. And having gone through a number of years of pets where the average president elect is somewhere around three to five years with the rotary experience. But take advantage of the resources that are out there. We, we certainly have a tremendous uh, resource in the Rotary International website and the Learning Center. And I don't think anywhere near enough people take advantage of that. Yeah, some of it's kind of cookie cutter and boring, but you always pick up something. So I would suggest that one of the things that a potential incoming leader, again, at whatever level does, is to reach out and say, hey, where can I get information? How can I get information from other people in my club? Who are my allies in the club? Where can I get information from the district? Where can I get information from the Rotary International website? It's true. Well, there is way more information than most of us use, right? <laughs> um, uh, even the district website, you know, I, I look at the district website, all the information that's out there. And it's amazing, uh, you know, I know myself, but um, it's like every position I've held, I've found out more things. It's, you never see the whole picture until you're kind of forced to like, uh oh, I need to find out more about this. And then all of a sudden you realize it's been there in front of you the whole time. Um, so yeah, looking for resources. So the, the district website, the RI website, um, and those have multiple links to other information. Um, certainly our predecessors that you were mentioning before, that's another way, it's, it's obviously a resource. Um, what other resources might you find? And uh, Judy or Pamela? Where do you find resources for what you need to do? Google. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, I think one of the things that you, the, the club president can do is to involve his committee chairs. Well, probably eight or nine years ago, we had foundation moments and we had membership moments. And this was within the zone. And I think Wynn created the foundation model, I think, but I'm not sure. Um, and what that said was the foundation chair at each meeting would get, get up and give just one minute about foundation and information and where the club stood or what was happening internationally. The same thing with membership. 
the more Rotarians know about Rotary, the better Rotarian they will be. They want that information. They may not come out and say that, but they want that information. They want to be solid in, in, in that knowledge and that time investment that they make every week. So I think the more information we can give them, just a short blurb. You don't want a whole program necessarily, although that can be a part of it once, a, once or twice a year. But um, I think that they, can, they become more involved that way. So um, I think if the president involves community service, vocational, a youth, um, the more understanding the members have, the better off they are. Totally true. Um, and there are definitely clubs that do still have those. It's not, um, not every club takes advantage of them, unfortunately, but it definitely are some that do. Um, and uh, like you, I think it's, you know, having a short and sweet, it's, it, it's just like a little, um, it keeps it front of mind for one thing. I think that that's an important part of it. And it adds, I don't think people realize that, you know, even those short blurbs can become cumulative, um, a bunch of information, a bunch of knowledge that it accumulates over time, even in those little one minute blurbs. Um, and when it is front of mind like that, then people are more likely to go out and talk to a business associate or a friend or a neighbor about Rotary, or they're more willing to go out and, and contribute to a foundation um, and promote when you have fundraisers and that sort of thing. So it just keeps it in the front of mind. Um, and I also think that your comment about uh, connecting with committees more and more, making sure that the committees do have an opportunity to work, that they first you suggest that they meet regularly. Sometimes we just, we have clubs where it's a committee chair, but there is no committee. And so they never really meet. And then they're never asked to report on what they're doing. So nothing really um, moves forward. And so calling on those committee committees slash committee chairs to report, I think is also a good thing because it's another way to get them involved and make sure that they are staying on top of whatever it is that they have been assigned to, to work on. Um, well, you talked about um, the fact that clubs were having problems finding those folks that wanted to become president. And I think in some respects, we have to grow our membership towards that. And by having a committee to stand up and give a presentation, not, not a big one, but a short one, just right. to feel how it is to stand up before the membership. I think that's really important because there are people that are just really, of course, I think Toastmasters plays a big part of this, but, or could play a big part of this. But I think we have to get people used to standing up and, and doing a small presentation in front of a group of people. As you know, it can be very frightening. Um, very much so. Yeah, they kind of, that, that kind of build. They kind of like that building. with <laughs> leadership in the club also. Yeah, and it's interesting. Go, you know, it's such a tie back how stepping up to leadership is so tied in with that public speaking piece where people where so many people are reluctant or afraid of, like you said, getting up and speaking, even if it's a short amount of time. Um, I think that um, the more we promote that, I, I'm in total agreement, Helene, that um, get it, giving people the opportunity to, to do that is so helpful. And it's, it's really such a, a it's another benefit of Rotary, you know, that personal development, that opportunity to grow and be able to stand up. Um, <laughs> I remember how, uh, I, I mean, I, people don't always think of me as being shy, but I was a total wallflower, could not 
speak up in class, for example, you know, does anyone have a comment? Does anyone have a, um, the answer to the question? And I, I would never speak up because I was afraid. And what was I afraid of? I think a lot of times I was afraid to be wrong. I was afraid to make a mistake. I was afraid to feel silly in front of my peers. Um, and as I've gotten older, I've realized that, you know, we're all just human. <laughs> it's like, okay, am I made a fool of myself? So what? It's just, I'm another human being doing the best I can. Um, but it's a real fear. It's a, it, it is definitely a real fear and it definitely holds many of us back. I have kind of an awful question and she may choose to answer it or not, but since we've joined Judy's club, club this year during the pan, uh, pandemic, I'd like to ask you what leadership roles have you held in the sports club and choose not to answer it if you don't want to. What? What leadership role have you personally held within sports? Oh, personally, I, I've um, led a lot of committees. I've turned down being president because I'm smarter than most people. Uh, <laughs> Not but I, I get involved in just about everything. I like to actually do the stuff. Get my hands dirty. Thank you. And I'll be hitting you up to join some committees <laughs> real soon. <laughs> Especially ABO. So tell us a little bit about ABO because I don't know if everyone knows about it. It uh, stands for Achievement Beyond Obstacles. And it started about 24 years ago with um, Reno South. They had a scholarship program like most of us have. And they decided that they wanted to take the money and give it to scholarships, not to the kids that usually get the scholarships, but um, the students that have overcome major obstacles and they can be anything from um, medical, uh, abuse, uh, addiction, financial, just uh, array of different obstacles, but they still continue to go to high school. They're on track to graduate and they really want to go to college or a vocational school. And those are the ones we recognize. And we, um, each year we have every high school in Washoe County um, nominate some students from their school. The very few I think Judy just froze or is in the process of freezing. Judy, you're freezing. They teach the kids their obstacles how to use the board and we have uh, financial literacy they how to get their fast get up their fafsa um how to all the things to consider um hey judy i think you finally frozen there <laughs> um so I, I think that, first of all, I love ABO and it's a, it's a fabulous program that um, Sparks and some of the Reno clubs work with. Um, and that was a perfect opportunity to have a public speaking opportunity, right? It was a topic, I, I think we can do that with others. It's, it's a topic they're interested in and just ask them to tell us a little bit about it it becomes less threatening than if we say, will you do a presentation about and, and give us a full fledged Judy's passionate about that. Well, she's not afraid to talk either, but, but still as someone who is involved in that, just ask them a little bit about it. It's a curiosity thing, but it's also an opportunity for them 
to share a little bit more about something that they're involved in or something they, that they love. Um, I think you might find it interesting Paula, that the Sebastopol Club uh, came up several years ago, saw the ABO program and it started their own, very similar to it, doesn't have the preliminary institute that ABO has, but um, to listen to these kids and they take them through a, a day's worth of personal mentoring and, and as a part of the day, our mentors all make presentations as to what obstacles they have overcome. So it shows the kids that, uh, you know, they're not alone in this whole thing. And then they, on a normal year, the, uh, the final group gets up and does a presentation. It ties in very closely with what we're going to be doing next week. And that's going to the graduation and the continuation school down in uh, Sebastopol. And to hear the stories of the three or four selected speakers tell um, really stops all of the adults in that in the thing of the obstacles that these kids have overcome. Yeah, if these kids can do that, you think what's holding me back, right? Because they've, they've overcome incredible obstacles, I agree. Um, uh, it, it's very inspiring, um, but it's, it's great. I think that, you know, here, that is also how we um, spread ideas from club to club is having speakers come and talk about different things like this and it inspires us to go out and do more and judy you froze up and that's why we um, oh i yeah. i got kicked i got kicked off somehow <laughs> well i think you just you you started uh warbling and then eventually it just froze but um oh. what, one of the things we were saying is that because you're so passionate about it when we asked you to speak you just started talking about it in history and, and all of, of what it is, it's an opportunity to share in a non-threatening way, just about something you're passionate about. And it's a way to get people to start um, opening up in terms of public speaking. I think it's promoted as storytelling. People, everyone can tell yeah. it now. to tell it. And they are so, uh, it's much easier for them to tell a story than to do a presentation. Totally. You have to write it out and then go word for word. So I think storytelling is really important. Really good point. Thank you, Holly. That's it's true. Um, <laughs> I don't know why it seems so much different, but it does. It, it's it it's it's like you're just sharing a moment rather than having to share your knowledge. And somehow that seems different, right? <laughs> I don't know, <laughs> but it's true. One of the things that I think people sometimes forget, um, and I'll own up to it myself, but sometimes when you become, you get into a leadership role, you forget something called balance. <laughs> what is balance? <laughs> Say that again, Bruce. Governor. <laughs> yes, yes, well, exactly. So, but it happens in all in many different roles. So what what is balance? Pamela or Judy? And what do we have to balance? Family, outside <laughs> relationship. One of the things when I was um, when I was a, a coach in my twenty years doing life coaching and even and leadership coaching, one of the things that we talk about is is balance, and I think it's a really important um aspect to remember that rotary or whether it's your work if you're you know whatever it is that that's just one aspect of your life and maybe these aren't equal high slices but they all have a part to play in our life so so one of these slices may be labeled family and one might be your 
spouse or your primary relationship, or one might be finances or health um, or your friends or work. And rotary might be one of those slices, right? So it's, I think it's a, a, a way to look about at each of these in a, if you labeled each of these categories and just say, am I doing what I feel I should do or could do in each of these categories? And then if not, if one of these categories is being shortchanged, what else do I need to do? How do I balance out so it doesn't feel so overwhelming? Because I think that's what's happened sometimes when, when we focus too much on one thing and we let all the other pieces slide. And then it feels like overwhelm. I think one of the, I think one of the things we have to remember is that Rotarians are big on fellowship. And we talked a lot about very serious subjects this morning, but I think we also need to do um, social events. Um, in our club in Sebastopol, we always did First Friday. And that meant we got together at somebody's house or at a bar. And at somebody's house, everybody brought their own drink and a dish to share. And that really became very, very strong because at that point you can bring your kids, you can bring your spouse, and you get more kids and more spouses involved. It's easier to be a Rotarian. And so I, I really think that we have to also consider that social aspect of Rotary, that really we develop those friendships and that's important for us. Moving up here and knowing some people, but not being able to meet a lot of people, it's really been hard for us. And now that we can start to get out, it's like, whoa, okay, how do we do this? Um, we really can't wait until that first hybrid meeting. <laughs> yeah, it, and it, uh, quite frankly, it sounds like you had a really, um, really special club that you belong to in Sebastopol as well. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Say again, Bruce. The more the spouse understands about Rotary, the easier your job is to be a Rotary. <laughs> Trust me on that one. Yeah. They become involved too. They don't always become members. I had a district governor, uh, a friend of mine who was going to be district governor, and he said, I wish my wife Peggy would be having a Rotarian. And I said to him, when she's ready, if and when she's ready, she'll become a Rotarian. And she did become a Rotarian. Um, and she was a good Rotarian for about five years. She did a lot of stuff um, in the zone. And uh, well, not the zone, but in the district. And internationally. And I got a, um, an email from her last week. And she had withdrawn from everything. She said, I need to concentrate on myself again. I want to support him and what he's doing. But she said, I need to get back to myself again. So we still yeah. have parents also. Um, but that's okay. That's okay. Yeah. Well, you know, what's interesting as you were talking, I was thinking about this balance wheel. I mean, we need to do it for our personal selves. And what do we need to have balance? And it sounds like Peggy needed to get back to having a better balance in that personal life, we could also do a balance wheel for our rotary clubs, right? Yeah. What do we need to focus on? And maybe, you know, if you did it as an exercise for one of your meetings, it might be kind of fun and say, where are we, are we, um, are we at a level eight or nine or 10, if you will, in all of these different areas. And maybe if your club isn't, um, doing a lot in fellowship, maybe it needs to do more. Or maybe there's a club that isn't doing much in international or vocational and wants to focus more and balance more out. I, you know, it's just an interesting way to look at what's in front of you and, um, and get everybody's input about what could make it better. Or it, in the case of your personal life, obviously, it's more you taking a look at within. Um, and I do think that that's part 
you know, there's been a few times this year my uh, husband has said, oh, you're on the phone again, you know, or because that's part of being a governor. Or I had an AG just recently saying her family was over and her little three-year-old grandson, um, she was on the phone and the grandson said, rotary, rotary, rotary. <laughs> because rotary was taking up a lot of, you know, grandma's time. So I think we all need to look at that. And that is an important aspect. If we want to stay feeling good about who we are and what we do, balance is an important criterion. I think it's a, an important way to think about it ahead of time. You know, it's a way to prepare is what do I want? You know, how much time um, is all of this going to be as part of my life? I think that keeps us healthy as individuals. Um, what other things? Triggered a thought in my head. And again, uh, it's mainly because I don't know the people involved right now in the Sparks Club. But I think one, one exercise that might be worthwhile, and it could be done either by survey or in a meeting, is to break up the activities of Rotary into a number of different areas, international service, local community service, et cetera, and have the members specify what their primary interest in Rotary, give them only one choice and say, okay, if Rotary didn't do anything else but, and I'll use international for example, international, I would be really happy. And you take that and you see, what are the demographics of the club? You may have a club that has 80% are interested in international, and 2% are interested in vocational, whatever vocational means these days. Uh, that seems to me like possibly an interesting exercise a club could do. Well, it, it would be interesting. And, you know, the reality is, especially in today's Rotary, you can have a Rotary that, um, that has a special focus, a, a unique focus, right? Uh, <clears throat> and, so it could be that you, your, your club, and using your example, maybe your club, it becomes an international club, that that is your main focus, that you do some other things in other areas, but everybody's passion is around international, then put more focus into it. It's okay to do that. Um, or if everybody's into vocational and, and you're really about doing business development in your own community, that's okay too. That's the other beauty of having multiple clubs in uh, an area is that you can find the club that really fits with who you are and what your passion is all about. Um, and or the other side of that is hopefully everybody gets to contribute to what that culture within your club really looks like. Um, because I think that's important too. I mean, and this is why preparing for leadership, listening to your members, right, is so important. And I ha have it listed twice on purpose because you want to be listening and continue to listen because things can change or maybe you didn't hear it right the first time. Um, so just always be listening to what's going on around you, I think is such an important way to prepare for what you need to be working on. Um, but that's, that would be an interesting exercise, um, to, to, to do with your clubs. You know, it's interesting when you talk, when you think about going to pre-pets and assembly, there's so much you want to share with the club prep the incoming, the PEs or whatever. And there's so little time, but just your exercise. That's a great example of something that you could do to say, let's, let's look at where we are going. It's another way, if you will, to look, to potentially create a vision. It's a miniature version of that, right? Of looking at what's, where, who is our club? How do we define ourselves and where do we want to go with? It's kind of doing a needs assessment before you spend your money and your time. 
<laughs> yes. And that's what we're trying to encourage all the clubs to do is to do a needs assessment, um, both a community perspective, but also within your club. Who are we? What do we want to do? What are our needs as club members and our passions? So good, really good point and discussion. Um, we're right at 1055. So um, anything else we want to add to this list? We talked about telling stories, making sure we ask people to tell their stories. I think that's a really important one. Um, setting up club retreat. That's another great one. Uh, working with your predecessors, finding the resources that are out there. Lots of different ways we can prepare ourselves. I think one thing we haven't talked on, and that's a personal invitation to others to come along with you in leadership. Find the person that you think might make a good leader. We've done that on a, several occasions in our other clubs where we think that person will make a potentially make a good leader and invite them to come along some responsibility along with your own leadership. And you know what, I, I'm in agreement and what's been frustrating to me a couple of times, Bruce, is that um, because there has not been a lot of people who stepped up to leadership, when they got that invitation, they thought it was just me filling a hole. Yeah. And it's not, right? you know, that's where we want people to be open to experiencing leadership in different ways because we don't want it to just be, oh, we have to have a name to fill this hole. No, that's not what we want. Um, I know there's one guy in particular in my club who I would love to see as club president. And he says, no, I'm, I'm just a better soldier than I am a leader. And it's like, but you don't, you know, I see these qualities in you. And I'd love you to step up. Willie, I don't know. But one of these days, I hope he does. So. Just when you ask him, say, not would you consider being called president or whatever, but would you help me be a better leader? Come along with me and help me and get him involved without necessarily the responsibility. And then that can potentially show them that there's. There's a lot of fun being a leader. Exactly, there it is. So any other ideas, comments for this topic of preparing to be a leader or the other thing I want you to think about and we have two sessions in June that we're gonna be meeting, but I would love if there's interest for us to continue into next year in some way. Um, and so I would love to hear back from any of you about what we'd like to do in the coming year in terms of leadership development, open conversations like this. Um, what would be more helpful? What would be more beneficial? What would be um, interesting and inviting to you or to others? So um, I'm just going to pose that question. I'm no, not looking for an answer right now. I just want to put it out there to think about. And um, I, I think before I let you go, before you let us go, I think one thing that might make these sessions more useful and get more people involved is if we can touch the folks that we know and say, would you come and talk about how you and your club have addressed a particular issue or a particular piece of leadership development. Let them come and brag about it. Rather than presentation being a true conversation, these have been great. I've enjoyed them. So invite them to come and talk about something that works really well in their club. Yes, exactly. Make, make, it, a, make it a brag session. I like that. Um, that's a great idea. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And if any, oh, go ahead. Yeah. 
been such a unique series of getting together with you in leadership. Um, I've, we've never seen it done before. Uh, I think it's a wonderful um, aspect to encourage president elect to tune in on this once a month, probably on a Saturday, you get more, more people on a Saturday, um, and start their training. PEF is all about leadership. It's not about the nitty gritty of how to run a club or to be a leader. And I think this could be so valuable. Uh, to have one topic a month, how to um, increase your membership. Um, how, uh, I don't know, I'm not gonna get into the topic, but I think that once a month, we really promote this to the, the president elect and anybody else that's interested. Um, that's the way you build leadership. <clears throat> it's, um, I think what you've done is extremely valuable. Uh, we really enjoyed this. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. It, really? it's, um, <laughs> it, it, you know, the, the whole idea that started was because I kept hearing that people were afraid to be leaders, you know, I mean, or reluctant to step up to leadership. And when I talked to the various in the club visits and to the board that I heard that over and over and it's like, I don't know, you know, it, um, I, I don't want leadership to be something that people are um, afraid of. I, I, you know, I want it to be something that's inviting and people are excited about uh, because I think it's one of the benefits. From it. But oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Oh. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> I'm having a heck of a time today. Here. I think I think you can equate it to growing your membership. We we want to see younger members. Um, we need to see. Um, more energy into our clubs, and if, if and when we have when we have younger members that they're going to be in leadership roles, we need to encourage that and hear what their ideas are because lottery is changing. That's for sure, and we and we need yeah we that have been in lottery for a long time have to acknowledge that and have to participate and listen to these people so that their clubs will be vibrant. You know, there's that whole vibrant, how to have a vibrant club. Absolutely. Well, I think if we can do something like that, it would be very valuable. Well, I, I love that idea. And I cut. club anymore. <laughs> it's not the same, um, that's for sure. But inviting the young people to come at, to this and to share what, what's interesting what they want or what's of value to them within their clubs and what um, what keeps them motivated and interested in Rotary. So um, all of those that I think are good and um, the idea of once a month, maybe on a Saturday um, is, is definitely a, is a possibility. And even, you know, PEs and or, and presidents, I mean, if they're interested or, um, anybody else is is certainly a possibility. Anyway, we are over our time. I want to I want to respect all of us for that. Um, I know it was short, a, a, a small group today, but I always appreciate you being on. And um, Bruce and Helene, you have so much experience, and I value that very much. I am really looking forward to seeing you two in person um, very soon. <laughs> Let's hope. Uh, it's been it's been hard not to be together. So, Pamela, it was great seeing you on uh, last night at the foundation dinner, and Judy. Um, I'm hope trying to make it so I can come to the ABO uh, presentation this week, this coming week. So yeah, June June fourth. June 4th. So I'm hoping, keeping my fingers crossed that I can come to that as well. Okay. Good. So take care. And, and Bruce and Elaine, that would be a great one to come to if, if you haven't been to that. It's going to be totally different this year because it's going to be not a formal dinner. It's going to be outside ice cream social. 
Okay. So we can distance. So that's the same day that you're going to Sebastopol? Yeah, we're going to go down from the first to the fifth. Uh, oh, oh okay. So well, that's too bad, but it's too you'll bad. have a great time in Sebastopol. And, so. First time okay. in the year. Yes, it is a busy time of year, exactly. Okay, you guys, well, thank you again. And we'll be putting something out. Um, we have it recorded. I'm gonna stop the recording right here. And um, 